Uh, so Sandy, uh, your new film Shirkers is a really fascinating look at uh, art and, and life and all of that stuff in between. Tell us a little bit about the film for people who haven't seen it and about how you came to make it. Oh boy. Um, um, so this film, it's a personal film. It's about, um, I think it's about something that happened in 1992 when I was um, a teenager in Singapore and I made Singapore's first road movie with my friends. It was called Shirkers. I wrote the script and I played the lead um, character named S, who was a 16 year old, um, you know, killer, I guess. Um, and then we shot this film with my film instructor named George Cardona, who is this very enigmatic American man who was in his 40s. And he, um, we shot for about two and a half months. And at the end of it, he vanished with all the footage. And Shirkers, this movie is about me kind of dealing with this um, 20 years later when the footage resurfaces and getting the band together again and just trying to solve the mystery of what happened and as well as dealing with the fallouts of our friendships and all the other characters whose lives, new people whose lives I discovered were also affected by what happened to us. There's a lot packed into that. Uh, so. <laughs> uh... Take us back to uh, the beginning of of your journey with this particular film. I mean, when you found so, so the footage disappears for twenty five years after you yeah. shot it, it reappears. What was it like for you when you first heard that this this film that you had made all these years ago finally the footage had had been found? Um, it was. I was frozen because I was in the conversation with the person who returned it to me and. Um, it was like, it was like a, you know, it was a gift and a curse, right? I just didn't want to know what to deal, I mean, how to deal with this thing that, that had suddenly reemerged in my life. It was, um, it was like a, a dark force. Um, and um, I knew that the moment I began dealing with it, like it came back to me in boxes, seven boxes in total over a series of months. And I stacked them up in my living room. Um, just not wanting to open them because I knew the moment I opened them, I would be sucked into a vortex of uh, obsession. I would be, you know, maybe financial ruin and psychological damage. Um, so I, it took me a long time before I could even, you know, open these boxes and deal with them. And then as soon as I, I got the, the film um, digitized and I looked at the footage and I realized there was something really special there and that I had to tell the story because it's not just about me, it's about everybody else who worked on this thing. Um, and I had to get my friends back together again and talk to them about this. Um, it was extremely difficult a process because it was such a, a dark place for all of us whose lives were affected by it. And um, it was, you know, the whole process of convincing people to be to reopen this wound, um, the wound that actually kind of bound me and say me and Jasmine and Sophie, the three teenage girls who were involved in the original Shirkers. Um, it's such a deep wound. I mean, we don't have to talk every day, but we're kind of bound by this event that happened to us when we were young. To bring this up again when everyone's moved on and grown up um, was a difficult thing for all of us. And I mean, uh, using this as the subject of a documentary, I mean, why did you think the documentary format in particular would serve this journey of, of self-discovery and, and this journey of dealing with the past mm -hmm. well? Um, because, you know, I mean, you could do it in a fictionalized fiction film, but this being so, so much stranger than fiction, um, you know, people would think you made it all up. I mean, that some of the things that happen to us, you just can't make up. It's just so incredible. Like some of the things that happen to us, um, and, you know, to, to do it as a fact-based non-fiction film, I thought was the best way forward. Also the footage itself, the footage from the original Shirkers, the 16 millimeter footage, um, this was the best way in which to showcase, you know, this this footage um, as well. Mm -hmm. So um, in a book, I, I could think, I don't know, it would be static, um, but this was the best way in which I could also incorporate the fact that um, I'm kind of rediscovering my passion in filmmaking and you know, coming together to tell the story in this new 21st century way, essentially in this, with the same spirit of the original Shirkers, you know, which is very DIY and 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 um, handmade, but um, on a larger scale in the 21st century with a larger tribe. Right. I mean, you know, you talk about um, 
your love of filmmaking and certainly uh, in the movie, you know, talks, you deal a lot with growing up in Singapore and how you discovered movies and, you know, how, as somebody who grew up in a, in a small town myself and, and loved movies, you know, and uh, arrived at a lot of things late because they weren't available, that really yeah. resonated with me. Can you talk a bit about, uh, a little bit about that and about some of your influences for the film that you ended up uh, making, the original Shirkers? Yeah, um, it was very difficult getting hold of things. As you know, as uh, all my friends who grew up in small towns, and this is why I'm so glad that this 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 film is getting shown on Netflix that, and can reach all these people in small places that were like us, who didn't have access to stuff. Um, you know, it was, they became more magical, these totemic items, these movies that I would read about in magazines. This was pre-internet. This is the 80s and 90s in Singapore. It was impossible to see movies. There was censorship. Whatever came was Jurassic Park, you know, The Terminator. This is what we got. Um, so what I was interested in was, you know, the movies of J Jim Jarmusch, the Coen brothers, David Lynch. You could not find these things. So you had to be very, very creative about it. Um, I don't know how you, you went. Well, I guess you, you, you could go to your local blockbuster if you were lucky to have one. We didn't have such things. Um, what I had to do was either, you know, convince a parent, a guardian, somebody grown up to take me across the border to Malaysia to look for pirated VHSs of movies. Um, where you can sometimes find a fuzzy, fuzzy version of a Coen Brothers movie, you know, tucked between like Faces of Death and Cannibal Holocaust, or, or, or you, you know, you, 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 um, you, you, you have to be creative. And I had a cousin in Florida who was naive enough to listen to me and um, listen to my instructions on how to hook two DVDs, uh, no, two, two VHS recorders together, and um, I gave her a list of films. I said, you know, take your take your parents' blockbuster account and go rent these movies for me and make copies for me. And she did very obediently. And she taped them on on this one. She would take three movies onto one VHS tape and um, you know mail them to me. And and there would always be a combo of two movies I wanted to see and one I pretended I wanted to see. Um, like so, for instance, like Blue Velvet, Angel Heart, and Square Dance starring Rob Lowe and Winona Ryder. So to just to throw the scent off. And um, it was that kind of thing. It was very surreptitious. And this made the pursuit of movies much more active on my part. And when it's more active, I think it's more, I don't know, more religious, more special and more meaningful. Right. Uh, share some memories, if you could, about um, the, the making of the film when you were a teenager. This was something that was very near and dear to your heart. So, I mean, tell us a little bit about what that experience was like for you. Um, it was, it was a catalog. It was like long gestating in me. Even though I was not old, I had a long list of things I wanted to to stuff into this one form. So we had a hundred locations of all these like crazy places that no one's ever seen in Singapore, that people were too busy to notice around them. Like the fact that we had so many mannequin shops, I mean, strange things like that. And, you know, um, artificial limb shops, um, all these surreal things that I thought were were pretty remarkable. The, the topiary in the botanic gardens that no longer exist. Um, you know, people were too busy with their lives. People are always too busy with their lives in Singapore to notice the world around them. So I wanted to catalog all these things as well as uh, all the places, I mean, the faces of, of people that I met along the way um, and my family members, like my grandmother who was getting on and my little baby cousins who are, you know, gonna grow up someday and be uninteresting people. And I wanted to capture all of those things and my friends, um, in one form. So it was a mad, mad production of just stuffing all these things into this film. And the, 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 the best excuse for stuffing everything to a film that includes faces and places is to do a road movie. So it was a road movie, Shirkers was a road movie. And it was about me kind of auditioning people to, to join my tribe. And then I kill them. But 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 the thing is, um, so therefore I got the excuse to meet all these people and um, I know it sounds bizarre, but it was basically a catalog of all the faces and places that meant something to me. And we shot it over two and a half months on the streets of Singapore where nobody was doing this kind of stuff. So, um, you know, people were really open to us hijacking buses, um, stealing old people from old folks' home and homes and returning them um, and school children from school. I mean, there was nobody to tell us no because nobody had done this before. And it was very innocent time. Kodak gave us free film. I mean, it was that innocent. So we shot over two and a half months um, because we were all like, the light the, on the equator is so ugly that you had to wait for magic hour every day to shoot so it looks decent. 
and magic hour on the equator is 15 minutes. So every evening. So you wait for those 15 minutes and you wind up having to shoot for two and a half months. But it was an adventure. I mean, it was a great adventure for all of us involved. And it was definitely the biggest heartbreak of our lives when this was taken away. Well, is it, uh, you know, I, I know it's heartbreaking in the sense that the film was taken away. How is it now to see that, you know, this, you know, the sad thing that, that happened, you know, this, this work that got taken away from you has now been morphed into something that is very acclaimed and, and has launched you onto a national stage, but, but in a different format. I mean, what is that feeling like for you? Does it help make up for the heartbreak of having lost that film? Yeah, I think it does. Um, you know, cause it has to, um, but it's, it's been a great joy. Um, just, in terms of you know I'm a I'm a I'm a probably a bad friend I I never call I never write this was making this <clears throat> this film was my excuse to kind of reach out to all these people in my life that were involved in Churkers and and you know over the last twenty years um, to say hi I mean it was it was the way of reach my excuse for reaching out explaining to them what happened you know, so I got back in touch with them on that level, on the personal level, on the human level, that was very satisfying. On an artistic level, I managed, I, I think, um, you know, I kind of like rediscovered my love for filmmaking and my confidence in in the form, in, in the fact that I can do these things. Um, and it was, it, it also was tremendously satisfying to showcase the work of all these people who had worked on the original Shirkers, including the actors, the actors who gave great performances, who were grownups that we convinced to be in the film as kids. and. Um, you know, who who took time off work and just never knew what happened to to these three vanished light, uh, three vanished months. And you know, I just felt very vindicated to to kind of give them back a chunk of their lives that had gone missing for twenty five years. Um, so on that level, on the 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 human level as well as on the personal artistic level, um, it's been immensely gratifying. Well, I mean, it's something that um, you know happens unfortunately all the time in this business. I mean, um, you know, you make. Uh, you put your heart and soul into little guerrilla films or, or even big budget films, and then suddenly mm -hmm. they disappear. So, I mean, what advice would you give to people who maybe have have done something like you did uh, in their lives, and and maybe you know might have it might have been lost forever? I mean, what advice would you give to somebody like that in a similar situation? Um, keep well, be brave. Um, if, if something like that happens to you, I mean, that's really, really bad luck. But I know it happens more than than I've, you know, been hearing from people who've had these kinds of things happen to them, and they're really lost. You know, like stuff left on the train, lost. Yeah. Um, so it's 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 it would be unfair to say keep hoping. I mean, but at the back of your head, one hopes. But that also inspires, I think, great creative ideas. Like what would happen? You know, just like spark new ideas in you. Like what would you do if you found it again? Or you know. There, there might be an idea that spins out of that and that can lead onto something greater or equal. Um, and it could be a different form. It could be a book. It could be another movie. It could be fiction. So, I mean, I think, I think, you know, I think it's, it's, we, we, we find inspiration in the weirdest places. And I think that a lot of times the most unfortunate strangers, most aberrant things that happen to you can create the, the best ideas. So um, be, be hopeful and just be open to ideas and just be open to inspiration. I think. Uh You've been making the rounds with this movie. You started off at Sundance where you won their directing prize in the world documentary category. What did that recognition mean for you? Um, it was it was wonderful that somebody um that people people recognized the hard work that um that went into this film because it was incredibly intricate and difficult to put together. Um and you know, basically with a a, a small um team of, of people who are not so well known and not so well connected. Um, so, so that was that was an, it, it, it immediately gratifying that that people, and and but on the personal level, I think it gave me, um, you know, just the confidence um, that I mean, I don't know, it's, it's 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 strange that one needs external validation, but it, but one needs external validation to know that this works, um, that people are enjoying it, it's working on some level, and that you know that you are empowered to do this basically make this film in your garage and it can reach the world and, and touch people. And it, 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 you know, that, that's something you can do and that with a small team, basically in your garage DIY style can reach out into the world, which I think it's a, it's a really strange thing for me that this is gonna be 
um, you know, out on Netflix. It's um, reaching all these kids in all their garages and maybe dreaming of doing something similar. Uh, you said you're rediscovering your love of film. Do you have anything that you're working on right now that you can uh, talk about or any scripts? I, I'm, I'm working on oh, a, a lot of things, uh, but, uh, okay, not a lot, a bunch of things right now, but I, I you know, it's just, I'm not, I, I can't talk about them quite yet, but, um, but I am really busy. I'm so excited to get them out, well, to a point where I can talk about them and to a point where you, I can actually show them to the world. But yeah, I am, I'm really busy at work um, making up for lost time. You know, when, when, when your life vanishes into a vacuum for, for decades, you actually, um, you know, just land running, I guess. Well, you know, you're uh, proof positive that you should never give up on your passions. And uh, yeah. so I really look forward to what you do next. Thank you so much for your time. Congratulations. Thank you so much. And yeah, you should never give up. I mean, it's you, it's never too early. First of all, because with strippers, it was seemed like we were a little early. And now it's, it seems a little late, but it's never too early. It's never too late. I think it's, you know, just, just do it. Absolutely. Thank you so much Thank for your time. Thank you so much. Bye. Yeah.